During these last three evenings of Evensong, and tonight, uh, this fall, I have been presenting on the origins of Christian worship and uh, drawing on a lecture given by Father Thomas Hopko in 2012 called From Shadow to Reality, Ancient Christian Worship. Tonight, I'll also be drawing on uh, the work of John P. Manosaki's God Beyond Metaphysics, the Theological Aesthetic. Just to review at its core, the early church's worship is based on the scriptures, the law, the psalms, and the prophets of the Old Testament with a strong messianic theme. For the early Christian, the messianic age had been fulfilled in Jesus. Worship was understood to be the continuation of worship of Israel in the new age, the new creation, the eschaton. The eschaton is the end times, the end meaning the realization of purpose, fulfillment, the goal, the realization of a destination. And this end has been realized in Jesus Christ, but not fully realized until his coming again. The kingdom is now, but not yet. So Christian worship has always a future orientation. Come. Lord Jesus, come. Last week, we talked about the place of worship. The temple has been destroyed, and the new Jerusalem of the Christian is now nowhere on earth. Rather, it is coming as a bride, as the ultimate fulfillment of the ages. The only temple is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you and me. Holiness, Christian worship, takes place where the Christians are. This evening I'm going to address the nature of time in Christian worship, first with a brief sketch of some practical applications, but really followed by a short reflection on the meaning of time itself from this big loaded word, an eschatological perspective. So Christian worship is concerned with the consecration of time. The most important event in time that almost all Christian worship evolves from is the Pascha, the great Passover of the Lord, the great vigil of Easter. Through the Passover, like the Eucharist, it is a memorial of God's saving acts of the past, but really it is future-oriented. Christ is the first fruit. The way has been opened for the realization that is arriving from the future. The future realization, the eschaton that already exists in perpetuity, that's the communion of saints, breaks into time, breaks into the present. This is where these words come from, like the holy mysteries that we celebrate, is the encounter with the true reality, perpetual reality, erupting into history. So following the great Passover feast, we have seven times seven days plus one, 50 days until Pentecost, which is also an eschatological number. It's a foretaste of the coming age with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on those who belong to Christ who is risen from the dead. And then we have uh, the, the festival of booths and the, uh, uh, which Christians uh, adopted as their own. And then the darkest night of the year, the winter solstice, is again drawn from pagan tradition, the festival of lights, the rekindling of the lamps, and Christians use this as the celebration of the incarnation and the revelation of the Messiah. Now, now celebrated, of course, on December 25th, originally it was one big long festival, including uh, the nativity, circumcision, the temple dedication, the baptism in the Jordan, and the light that shines in the darkness, the epiphany, the shining forth of God. And this our incarnation feast is preempted by a period of abstinence or fasting, which is what Advent is. It's a waiting and expectation for the Word made flesh. Then beyond the seasons of the year, there were the days of the week, and Christians gathered on the Lord's Day which is one day after the Sabbath, also called the eighth day, seven plus one, the day of the coming age, 
Now, for a variety of reasons that we don't need to speak to tonight, the West came to think as Sunday as the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath holy, we've all heard. But Saturday is really the Sabbath. Sunday is the day of the coming kingdom. And that is the day when Christians gather to hear the gospel, sing the psalms, make the prayers, preach the gospel, and celebrate the Holy Eucharist. And then we have hours of prayer, seven times per day, as the psalms suggest. The hours or offices of the church was composed almost entirely of scripture and largely the psalms. A day in our tradition draw, begins at sundown, and that would be Vespers, followed by Compline, Vigil, ending in Lauds through the night, and Matins, followed by First Hour, Third Hour, Sixth Hour, Ninth Hour, etc. And this liturgy that we pray tonight, called Evensong, which is a sung evening prayer, uh, is, a, is a, uh, a, modern, a modern expression of Vespers and Compline in the reformers of the church in the 16th century. It was a compromise of the monastic offices for the common people. Thus we draw from the Book of Common Prayer. It was translated out of the normal liturgy of the Latin into the common tongue and meant to be prayed by all Christians every day. Well, the Renaissance imagination captured even song and it became the canvas for some of the most beautiful choral expression of all time. So though Evensong no longer necessarily serves the purpose for which it was originally intended, a daily uh, prayer in a common language for us all, we can prayerfully enjoy these beautiful choral uh, expressions. And I'll speak to that once more. Before I, I close on this concept of time, I'd just like to take one moment to reflect again on this rather loaded theological word, eschatological or eschatology. You can barely get it out of your mouth. Don't eat too much peanut butter before you say it. And what we mean by time itself. You see, we think and we live in time chronologically, in sequence, right? We all carry the weight of an irrevocable past of which we are powerless. The things we have done and the things done to us assume an undeniable authority as facts and give shape to who we are. Most of us understand ourselves as who we have been. In this line of thinking, the beginning functions as the cause. Does not cause come before effect? That's time in sequence. But the eschatological introduces a different kind of logic. Does the cross make any sense at all seen by itself? That is, as the effect of what has preceded it in the life of Jesus. You see, we would argue that the cross becomes the cross only once it is seen from the future. That is, from the point of view of the resurrection that follows it. Theologically, then, it is the resurrection that is the cause of the crucifixion. Further, Jesus' resurrection only makes sense in the light of the final resurrection of us all. His resurrection is the path that we too will follow. That is our end. Resurrection is our end. The cause of the things that happen and have happened lies not in their beginning, but in their end. Do not all things come from God, whom is also our end? Even Heidegger, the great existentialist, would say, it is not at the beginning, in the morning of consciousness and at the dawn of history, that man is truly himself. The beginning determines man in history only in so far as it remains an advent. So eschatology makes the seemingly impossible claim that I am not who I am, or even less who I was and have been, but rather like the theophonic name in Exodus 3.14, I am who I will be. Thus in Christian typology, the present condition 
That is, these things in themselves are merely the shadow, the adumbration of the things to come. Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer explores this idea in his thinking around the penultimate. History is seen not anymore as the outcome of the originary or the beginning, but as that which exists because and for the sake of the ultimate. The future is present in the present, hidden like the mustard seed in the soil, and thus already on its way to its surprising transformation. It is this eruption into the sequence of time that Christian worship understands of itself. It is a kairos, a vertical rather than linear experience of time in the moment. And this is how Christians understand the reading of Scripture itself. Revelation and Scripture happens in its eventness. The gospel is processed among the people, proclaimed and heard in a moment of time among the people of God in this particular place. And so it is with all Christian worship and this beautiful evening of evensong and the anthem that the choir is about to sing. The encounter with revelation, faith, like music, is more than the musical score or the words in the hands of the choristers. We are hearing from the author, the composer, the musician, this particular instrument, in this particular place, with these particular people, with this conductor, with these particular and, might I say, beautiful voices, and with the gathering of the faithful. Music is always a communication of more than the sum of its parts, captured in time but not beholden to time and never repeatable and only known in its performance. So it is among the people of God and our wounded Christ who is always and forever coming and breaking into our hearts. As we heard in our gospel reading tonight, Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So let's sit and listen and wait for him. Come, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> 